is, imagine this is your brain, and the interesting, sorry, <laughs> the interesting thing about it, um, this is the part that you always see in pictures, like the cortex. This is the part that does the thinking that we know of when we talk to ourselves. But inside here, we have these other parts that we're just starting to learn a lot about. So this is called the brain stem. You've probably heard about that. And it connects to your spine. So this is how your brain connects to your spine. And if you look at this stuff, it's exactly like the brain of a reptile. So now it's often called the reptile brain. And that's really amazing because we know what a reptile does and how it does it. And it's very simple and it doesn't confuse it with words and talking. So that gives us a good understanding of what's going on in our brainstem. But more interesting, inside here, <laughs> um, <laughs> this is um, what we call the mammalian brain. There's more stuff in here. So, <laughs> my minute. So, you may have heard of things like the amygdala, the hypothalamus, the thalamus. All these things are in the news all the time these days, and we're just starting to learn about how they work. And amazingly, animals have, every mammal has all the same amygdala, the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the hippocampus. Animals have the exact same thing. And we know what animals do, we know what it does in animals, and we do, animals just do it without putting words on it. So this is the part of you that has logic and learns from experience and has words to explain what you're doing. So what are these other parts doing? Well, very, very simply, your reptile brain is just involved in survival. So if you think of anything you do that a reptile can do, that's what your brainstem is doing. So basically, finding food and reproducing. And um, also, reptiles have to keep warm. So just sort of making sure that your basic needs are met. Like, have you ever been like so cold that you can't think of anything else? Or you're so tired that you can't think of anything else? You're so hungry that you can't think of anything else? So that's your reptile brain telling your body, hey, I have a really urgent priority need. Forget about philosophy and poetry. That's what matters, you know? So what about this part of the brain, the, the mammalian brain? Well, mammals have invented something that reptiles don't have. They live in groups. Reptiles can't stand each other. Reptiles are always avoiding other reptiles except when they're mating. And mammals actually live in groups, and that helped mammals survive. And these little structures here are part of why mammals survive. So mammals seek each other out. They cooperate some of the time. They make decisions. When am I better off just going for that piece of food? And when am I better off deferring so that um, this other one gets the food and he doesn't bite me? So it's amazing how these brain structures can make those social decisions, but it's really easy to understand that in animals. And I've written a couple of books about it, so if you're interested, um, you have my website there. Um, but what's really amazing, um, I mean, can I please have one of the cards? Thanks. So um, you all have one of these cards, and um, we all have brain chemicals, and this is how these guys work. They release chemicals that tell your body what the decision is. There's only two decisions you can make. This is good for me, or this is bad for me. So your brain is always sort of making decisions. It's either releasing happy chemical that says, this is good for you, go toward it, or this is bad for you, pull away from it. And in animals, it's really easy to see when they release these chemicals, they go towards something, and it it's really makes a lot of sense. Um, what I often do with people is uh, to read these poems together. So everybody's reading them, so let's just read them together. So on the back of the card, these are four happy chemicals that you probably hear about a lot, and they're in the news all the time these days. So um, let's just read dopamine, okay? Dopamine makes you jump for joy, 
when you reach a goal or get a toy. In nature, it helps you respond to food cues. Yippee, rewards cause neurons to fuse. Dopamine feels good, so you try to get more. It rewarded our ancestors' will to explore. Cocaine triggers dopamine, caution to all. Joy without goal seeking leads to a fall. <laughs> so uh, every one of these happy chemicals is similar to some kind of drugs. That's why drugs have an effect on you, because they're similar to your natural brain chemicals. But in nature, you only release these brain chemicals for a good reason, when there's some immediate impact on survival. Now, how do you know what immediately impacts survival? Well, you've spent a lifetime connecting up neurons in the big part of your brain that sort of recognizes this is good for me, this is bad for me. And that's why if you learn when you're young to go toward this and away from that, it's really hard to unlearn that and learn something else because you've built all these neural networks. Now I'll tell you a really amazing statistic. Two-year-olds have fewer neurons than newborns. So by the time you were two, you started getting stupider and losing neurons. But of course, I'm, I'm simplifying. What happens in a two-year-old is you're born with lots of neurons, but they're not connected to each other. And by the time you're two, the neurons that you don't use start disappearing so that the ones you use get stronger and they build more connections to each other. By the time you're seven, your neurons have so many connections that you decide you know, how to interact with other mammals in your group, who to go toward, when to go toward them, who to avoid, when to avoid them. So everything you, um, you uh, interpret as like an immediate boost to your survival or immediate threat to your survival from a seven-year-old point of view is sort of built into your neurons. So um, let's talk about. Somebody give me a five-minute warning. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's do the next one, serotonin. Okay. So um, maybe if you want to read it with me, serotonin swells your chest with pride when you get respect and needn't hide. You are still modest and don't like to boast, but no serotonin flows when you coast. You feel good when you boost yourself higher, but if others do this, it provokes your ire. I don't care about status, it's others who do, but serotonin spurts when the limelight's on you. So let me give you really simple examples of how these neurochemicals work in animals. Dopamine, okay, if an animal, let's say a monkey sees a coconut at the top of a tree, and his dopamine surges because he knows that coconuts are delicious. Why are coconuts delicious? Because they have a lot of fat. And in nature, fat and protein are hard to find. So dopamine tells you, wow, this is really good for you. Go towards it. So the monkey starts climbing up the tree. But it's a really hard climb, so he's getting tired. So what happens? The dopamine says, more, more, put in more effort. This is really good for you. This is really worth the effort. So anytime you're focusing on a long-run goal, dopamine is what tells you, keep trying. This is really good for you. This is really worth the effort. Okay? So whatever long-run goal you happen to wire yourself for, that's influencing what is releasing your dopamine. But at the core of it, is that the fat <laughs> that you're going toward or the basic survival need that your reptile brain understands. But then, of course, where our survival needs are met. So that's why we find more sophisticated, complicated, like, for example, mint chip ice cream would be <laughs> um, a complex example of fat. But of course, finding a way to get a promotion is another complex example of fat because it's a way to say my survival needs are met today but if I don't get that promotion my survival needs may not be met tomorrow okay so that's all the neurons that you've connected after you were seven years old that make those complicated decisions now um, it's an amazing thing about dopamine that I read that explains everything to me and is a little eerie 
Okay, they put these monkeys in a lab and they teach them to do a task. And in exchange for that task, they get one spinach leaf, raw, raw spinach leaf. And every day they do the task and they get one raw spinach leaf. And then one day, instead of giving the monkey spinach, they give it um, a piece of a, a grape. Now, a grape is sweet and delicious, and it, it has much more energy than um, spinach. So what happens? The monkey's brain release a lot of dopamine when they get the grape instead of the spinach. So whenever you get something that's better than usual, that's more than you expected, zoom, your brain releases a lot of dopamine. So what happened to these monkeys every day they would get a grape when they would do their task, but in a few days, what happened? Their brain stopped releasing the dopamine. Even though they were still getting the grape, they stopped releasing the dopamine because they expected it. They took it for granted. And that's why stuff that you get doesn't make you happy after a while. But what happens if you stop giving the monkey the grape and start going back to giving it the spinach? Then it went into a rage and threw the spinach back at the experimenter and went into a huge rage. Okay? Five minutes? Okay. So, now let me tell you an amazing monkey study about serotonin. This is really amazing and uh, we don't hear that much about it because it may not be the world view that you want to have, but we need to understand our brains. So, in every group of monkeys and every group of mammals, there's a leader. And biologists call it an alpha, or you could call it a boss. And all the others defer to that, and they often fight over who's the boss and who's the number two. And every group of animals you study is like this. They they have group dynamics, they fight over who's the boss. Well, we discovered that the monkey with who's the boss, his brain releases more serotonin. But you wonder, well, is he having more serotonin because he's the boss, or did he have more serotonin first, and that's why he became the boss? Now, why is this interesting? Well, you've probably heard about Prozac and antidepressants, and how do they work by increasing your serotonin? So this is interesting. So what they did to figure this out in monkeys, they put a one-way mirror between the boss and the other monkeys. Now monkeys have what's called a dominance gesture where the monkey who is the big shot literally makes a dominance gesture and the others literally submit. And it's like with the exact same muscles and posture that humans, like when you're proud versus when you're submitting. And it was a one-way mirror. The big shot monkey made a dominance gesture, and he expected the others to submit, but they didn't because they were behind a one-way mirror, and they couldn't see him. They could only see themselves. So what happened? His serotonin went down. And they did it every day, and his serotonin went down and down and down, and he started becoming a wreck, okay? And I've read the same thing in cows, okay? Even every group of cows, and just to say that women do this too, um, every cows are all females, and they have a boss, and when the boss can't be boss anymore, they research shows that she sort of falls apart. So, um, uh, I... I Time is finishing, but I'll just mention quickly, endorphin, you all hear about runner's high, and that's what endorphin is, but endorphin did not evolve to make you jog because in the state of nature you were running, of course, for food and hunting. And when you are hunting, you might get injured, and endorphin is released when you're injured. So you only get endorphin if you injure yourself. So that's not a good way, you know, uh, to be happy. Um, so, we're all interested in, well, what can I do to get more of these happy chemicals without bad stuff going wrong? And that's what my book is about, so if you're interested, I brought copies to sell, and um, I also check out my website. Thank you. Thank you.